Well, today we're talking about being thirsty, talking about John chapter 4, a little bit of John chapter 7. And uh, Justin did a wonderful job. He called me this week, and we were talking about what I was preaching on. He goes, really, that's why I already have all the songs lined up. We're talking about being thirsty. So we're really thinking about God doing a great work within our life. But when we're thinking about thirsty, we're thinking about maybe the woman at the well, or we think about Jesus proclaiming, anyone that thirsts, let him come after me. I want to give you a video, and it's videos talking about this woman at the well, and it goes through exactly what we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to dissect some of that down. What are we thirsty about? Sometimes we try to satisfy our thirst with things, and sometimes we get so many things going in our life, we stay thirsty because we don't go to the proper source that can satisfy our thirst. So this woman went through a lot of different things to satisfy her thirst, and her thirst was never quenched until she met Jesus. And our goal today is whatever you go through, whatever the issues you have in life, whatever you are longing for, we have to give those over, leave your water pot at the well, and walk back and say, thank you, Jesus, for taking care of my life. This woman at the well, it's a story that you've all heard. It's a story that you could tell from Vacation Bible School today. So don't just check it out. Don't just go to the ending of the story don't just say, I've heard the sermon before. Let's get into this thing and say, what fresh, what's something new that I can grasp out of John chapter 4 that I've never had before because I am thirsty. There's things within my life that I'm struggling with. There's things that I'm trying to do myself that I need to give over to God. Let us take some ideas from a scripture found in John chapter 4 and apply it to our lives today. Watch this video of the woman at the well.
a defining moment is that Jesus already knows everything about you. And he loves you. He, this defining moment that this woman at the well saw is that a sole individual sitting at a well that was a Jew, that the Samaritans and Jude, they, they never liked each other. They, the Jews thought they were better than the Samaritans because of, because of half-breed Samaritanism. So when, when Jesus was sitting at the well, it was a defining moment that Jesus said he had to go through Samaria because he knew that this divine moment was set, that this woman, who her deepest needs were being crushed, and she was internally not satisfied. And she needed somebody. She needed a savior. And Jesus said, I don't care about your past. I want you to be aware of your past. I want you to be self-aware of what you're going through and what you need. But I'm not going to repel you from it. I'm going to love you in spite of it. And sometimes in our generation... We have to understand that grace is the greatest gift that Jesus Christ could ever give to us. We all have a past, but we all can have a future. Isn't that awesome? We all can say, thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Let me understand that my thirst that I try to give is never satisfying. In the past, we've looked at a few individuals. We've looked at the rich young ruler. He walked away sad. It cost too much. And then we look at Nicodemus and we followed, but from a distance. A secret disciple, if you would. He didn't want to give it up until Jesus was crucified. And then he became a secret follower. And then the blind man said, all I know is once I was blind, but now I see. Well, I don't understand everything, but I understand. It's undeniable. I was blind but Jesus came into my life, and I can see it's indescribable, but it's definitely undeniable. And then the paralyzed man. Jesus met this personal man that lowered down in Mark chapter 2 in front of Jesus. And he said, your sins be forgiven you? I need a healing. But Jesus says, what I'm going to give to you is more important than a healing. I'm going to give you forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. Then, take up your bed and walk. So often we want the touch of God, but we don't want the spiritual aspect of forgiveness from God. We want the things from God. We want the Santa Claus God, but we don't want the Jesus God. Life is full of defining moments. Like landmarks in our life, those defining moments, as we have said many times, are like when we walk into a bright light. And Jesus, through the word of God, is trying to teach us something and what we do with that truth, with that defining moment, whether we open up our eyes and gaze on that truth and accept that truth and stand in that light and let that truth penetrate our hearts and we move forward. Or sometimes we get the news from Jesus, we get the word from God, and we don't like it. So we back into the house, into the known, and we don't allow the penetrating truth of Jesus to touch our lives and we stay where we are. And somehow, some way, Jesus, through his word or through his circumstances, will make you see the truth. Whether you like the truth or not is not the issue. There's a lot of truth that we don't like until we can understand what he's trying to do. And once we understand what God is trying to do within our life, that truth is there to elevate us, to give to us a relationship with Christ. And this Samaritan woman that had five husbands and now living with another man, she was embarrassed of herself, she was embarrassed of her past, and she was lonely. She was trying to satisfy her thirst with everything other than the spiritual aspect. But when you look at this, we could understand some of her situations. So she had five husbands. Maybe those five husbands left her for another woman. Or maybe those five husbands died. Maybe those five husbands tried to have a child with her and she was barren, so that husband didn't work, so he left her. So she went to another husband. And, and, and in the culture of the day, a, a woman's main responsibility is to give 
children. And if, and if she's barren, a man is going to divorce her and try to get another. I mean, it may not have been her fault at all. It may have been just genetics. It may have been her choices, or it could have been somebody else's choices. But in every situation, she is a lonely, lonely woman that lived in a small town that every sin and every issue that she went through was a public issue, and she was disgraced. She was disgraced. She was saddened. And in that culture, no one, not even the women of the city, clearly not the men, would have a relationship with her. She was despised. She was rejected. She was cursed. So that's why when she walked out to that well, midday, 12 o'clock, in a dry, barren land, to go to that well. And she walks to that well by herself, and she passes these individuals, these Jews. These Jews never made eye contact with her. They kept on going. And she was wondering, this is kind of weird that Jews would come through Samaria and come to my small town, but she kept on walking. And as the dust passed, she walks up to this well, and she sees an individual, a calming-looking man, sitting at a well. A very simple individual. Cross paths. And did she ever realize that she was about ready to talk to the Savior of the world? And he just broke the silence and he said, give me something to drink. Shocked her. And it maybe even shocks us that the Savior of the world was to talk to me. Wants to break the ice with my thirstiness. Wants to talk to me about the things that I need. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody cares about my soul. But Jesus does. Jesus breaks the ice. And Jesus talks to her. Jesus comes to her. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, the Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus is not a typical Jew. Jesus is the Savior of the world. If we could take it in, why would somebody from the church come to talk to me? You, 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 do you realize I have sin in my life? Do you realize I've done too much? Do you realize if I would go into the church, the doors would fall down? Do you know who I am? And do you know what I have done? And the body of Christ, if we die Christ, we should say, you know what? It is about grace. It's about forgiveness. It's not about where you were. It's about who you are. It's about where you are going. And if you embrace Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And that's what Jesus is trying to impact here. It's not about you're a Samaritan and I'm a Jew. It's you're an individual. And every individual needs the touch of Christ. She tried to even change the subject. She said, are you greater than our fathers Jacob who gave us this well to drink from? And Jesus, he was saying, I am. I am greater than Jacob. Because Jacob could only give you water that can quench your thirst temporarily. But the water that I can give to you, it's not a physical healing. It is a spiritual water that will overflow within your life. It will change your life. But you have to come to me and you have to accept it. And then Jesus did something that every counselor, every pastor would probably get fired over if they would say this. He's trying to bring her into this loving relationship. Trying to understand about this water that, that is free to her. And then he says this. Go get your husband. I bet she shucks her head. I said, uh, I don't have a husband. I don't have one. I was trying to ignore this situation. I thought I could hide this from this individual. I, I, I'm embarrassed about it. That's why I'm here at noon because nobody wants to be around me. And Jesus, go get your husband. Embarrassed, shamed, she says, I have none. And this is where Jesus shows his power. He says, you have spoken or what? Right. You have no husband because you have been married five times and the man you're living with is not your husband. She bows her head in shame again in that culture. It's, it's rare in this culture, but it was totally rare in that culture. And I'm sure at that time she thought, 
this is done. Once a man, once anybody finds out how shameful I am, they will run, they will never look back. Why would Jesus say such a thing for her? What, was Jesus trying to prove a point? He was. He was trying to let her see in the depths of her heart what her biggest need was. See, we all have needs. We all have some very deep needs. And the four deepest needs that each and every one of us have are the four needs that she had that she was trying to fill with things. She was thirsty. She was longing for certain things. She was trying to fill her life up with all kinds of different things. And Jesus was wanting to put a penetrating light of truth right into her eyes. And she could do one of two different things. She could stare in that light and she could accept that light of truth or she could say, I am done with you and walk away. She tried to change the subject, but Jesus would not allow it. He continues to talk to her. He continues to embrace her. And he continues to talk about a living water to a point that I'm sure that when she looked at Jesus, the, the, the God who became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus was different. When you talked to Jesus, you saw something different. The presence was different. And she saw Jesus was more than a man. She looked into his eyes and Jesus said, I am that Messiah. I am the one that can give you the living water. I am the one that can quench your thirst. I am the one that you're longing for. And what I want to give to you is water that you don't have to come back to this well every day. I want to give to you something not physically that will save you, but spiritually will change you. A living water that dwells within you that's going to rove over and go flowing. So what was her deepest needs? You know, you're going to see these four deepest needs, and you're going to say, you know what, I'm not much different than the woman at the well. I may act out different than the woman at the well. My action that causes a reaction may be different than the woman at the well, but the four basic needs are the same, and how you react to these basic needs. The first is acceptance. Every person desires acceptance. Do you like me? Am I accepted? If I go to your house and knock on the door, will you look through the window and shut the door? Or will you, hey, come on in. Am I accepted when I go to a place? I'm accepted at the house of God. Am I accepted any place? When you apply for college, am I accepted? When you go certain places, am I accepted? One of the biggest needs in our life is acceptance. And when one person rejects us, the first husband rejects us, the second husband needs to love us. And if he rejects us, and we keep on going down the road, three, four, five husbands, and the sixth man she's living with is not her husband. She needs acceptance. And maybe her issue was relationships, but maybe your issue is something different. But can you see where it is? Do you all want to be accepted? Yeah, we don't want to go through life alone. We don't want to go life without power, without love. The first is acceptance, and the second is identity. We want to be known. Who am I? What is my identity? Well, why am I going to school? What am I going to be known as and known for? I need to have an identity. And her identity, that she, that first husband, they walked down that aisle and they got married and and her identity, now I'm a missus, and now I'm married, now I'm going to be okay. Now everything I've done is taken care of because he is going to love me. And then when he cast her off, the next person I need, identity, you are going to be my identity. Then the third person, and then the fourth person, and then the fifth person, and then she just gave up. She said, I don't have an identity so at high noon, I'll just go out to the water by myself when there's nobody there. There's no women to go with me. Nobody wants to talk to me. I'll just live my life in shame 
and disgrace because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't even know who I am. Nobody accepts me. I don't have an identity. I'm all by myself and I'm lonely and I'm depressed. So I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to drink some more stuff. I'm going to put more sand in my face. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try on this relationship even more. I'm going to be more dependent upon somebody else because I need to have an identity. And the more that we put on somebody else, the more that somebody else repels from us. And then the third thing is security. We all want security. We all want to know that somebody loves us and somebody's going to take care of us. We all want to know that we are secure, whether it's in our homes or whether it's in our jobs or whether it's in our faith or whether it's in any issue. We want to make sure that we are secure. We want to make sure that I have enough money in the bank to pay the bills this month, right? We want to make sure I'm secure financially. We want to make sure we are secure in relationships. We want to make sure that we are secure in every area. If we are not secure, what happens? We become very insecure. And when we become insecure, what happens? We become very fearful. When we become insecure and fearful, what we have done is we broke acceptance and we broke identity because we have lack security. And when we become insecure, when we walk up to somebody, we're, we're thinking the first thing is, they don't like me. I, I, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll just stay home. Maybe I'll stay inside. Maybe I won't go someplace because if I go and they don't like me and I'm going to feel rejected, I feel insecure. So the, one of the major, major core values that we have to have is security. And if we don't have security, we become insecure. And when we become insecure, what happens is we become indwelt and we don't have passion for love and then one of the biggest things that this little woman did not have she did not have purpose what am I here to do what am I supposed to dwell on what am I supposed to work on what am I supposed to do and if this woman had five husbands now she's living with her sixth man and she looked at I'm not accepted I don't have an identity and I'm clearly not secure what is my purpose? Is my purpose relegated down to getting water at noon for a couple days so I can feed the livestock? Am I just a nothing? And when we get to the point that we do not have a purpose, what we do is we give up and we try to do more things to try to gain purpose and security and acceptance and identity. And we do more, 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 more. And we just get thirsty because everything that we do cannot and will not satisfy our thirst. Because that is all in the physical. And Jesus comes walking up to you in a well. He comes walking up to you with a penetrating truth. You cannot get acceptance on your own. You cannot have identity on your own. You will never have purpose on your own. But I, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, is sitting at a well of truth. And he says this, all the things that you've tried are making you thirsty. Every issue that you continue to do every day over and over and over and over again, those addictions that you're trying to satisfy the soul, oh, they may be temporarily, but long term, they leave you exhausted and thirsty. Wanting more, but gaining nothing. It's like drinking the seawater. Oh, it can satisfy your thirst for a second. But internally, it rots you, makes you hungry, and desire the real thing. And Jesus said at the well, this woman, her deepest needs crushed, devastated, probably internally has given up. Jesus looks at her. He said, I know that you're a Samaritan. And I know that I am a Jew. But I want to break those barriers. I don't want you to look at me as a Jew. And I'm not going to look at you as a Samaritan. I'm going to look at you as a child that needs forgiveness. You can't satisfy your thirst without me. If you knew who I was, 
you would be asking me for the gift of life. And the gift of life, if whosoever confess their sin, they will be forgiven. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the gift. And when she heard that he was the Messiah and she wanted the gift, she dropped her water pot, which is very significant, which means the thing that she came for was not important. The things that you satisfy your life with is not important. When you come to the face of Jesus and investigate the truth, you can say, you know what? I don't need that stuff. I don't need that temporary satisfaction. What I need is I need that living water that's going to change my life. I'm going to leave the water pot of life, and I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go tell somebody. I'm going to tell somebody what Jesus did. And he, she walks and runs into the city and goes up to the men, the leaders, and says, let me tell you something. I want to tell you a man that knows everything that I've done. And those guys were probably saying, we all know what you've done. I mean, this is a small town. We know what you've done. But she, with passion in her soul, she walks in and said, let me tell you what he said. So the city comes out and meets Jesus at the well. And they compel him, come in and stay with us. So he went into the city of Sychar, and he stayed there. And the Bible says many people gave their life to Christ because of her testimony and then because of his words. When a life is changed, when somebody is trying to fill their life and their heart with stuff, it just makes us thirsty. It makes us hungry. But the stuff that we're trying to satisfy with will never completely, internally change us until we have an encounter with Jesus. The defining moment, Jesus knows everything about you. Everything. The thing that you're trying to hide. The thing that you don't want to admit. And he is trying to put a penetrating light of truth dead smack in front of your face and say, you know what? I know, but I love you anyway. There's Jesus, a Jew, the Savior of the world, goes into Samaria to a well to meet a Samaritan woman that was the outcast of her town. Probably the lowest of the low. And Jesus said, and so you know what? I don't care. I don't care what they think. I don't care what my disciples think. What I care about is this encounter. So when we could take the light of the penetrating truth that is stuck into your eyes, what do you do with the truth when you know that Jesus wants to give you something that you cannot get on your own? That Jesus wants to come to you, sit at the well, and say, I don't want to give to you water that you will thirst again. I want to give to you a life-changing water that's going to change your soul. That's what takes to satisfy our thirst. Not more stuff. Not more relationships. A simple, God-honoring faith that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus loves us and that Jesus wants to change us. That is the thirst that Jesus wants to quench. The penetrating truth. You may have been here today and you may say, well, I had to come to church because of the wife. I had to come to church because mom or dad or I had to come to church because that's what I do on Sunday mornings. And you're sitting here and you're saying, you know what? I am thirsty. I am thirsty for a lot of different things. And I know I've tried over and over in this deja vu life. Every month, every week, every day I struggle with certain things. And I know that I'll never get over it without the power and the forgiveness of God. And he's sitting at the well of the altar and he's saying, give it to me. I already know about it, but I love you anyway. I want to help you through it. I don't want to condemn you because of it. I want to forgive you through it. And when we can go to the grace and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus, just like he did with this woman at the well, he said, I know everything, but I love you. I know everything, but you understand I have a gift for you. The gift that God wants for you is eternal life. I'm not judging you. I'm loving you. I'm not condemning you. 
I'm bringing you into a family. There's not a bigger opposite than a Jew and a Samaritan. But Jesus looked at that and said, you know what? I'm breaking every barrier because you need your thirst quenched. Are you thirsty? Are there things within your life? Maybe it's even your relationship with Jesus that you're struggling with. And you say, man, every day I'm struggling. Every, I've got these issues and I just need to, I need to drink some real spiritual Holy Ghost water that's going to well up within me springs of water that I'll never have to thirst again. We have to give our heart and our lives to Jesus. We can never meet our deepest needs on our own. We can't. Acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. The purpose of our life is to honor God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we come before you. And Lord, this great example of a woman that is just like us, that's struggling to meet the deepest needs of her life. And Lord, I pray just like this woman that she will come and have an encounter. Have an encounter that will change your life, that will change your city, that will change your future. That you don't get stuck in our past, but you open the door into our future. And Lord, I pray right now that we will look deep within our soul and be very self-aware of our deepest needs. And I pray that those deepest needs that we have, that you and you alone, that we'll go to, and we know that you are the answer to every issue within our life. And if we get these four deepest needs taken care of through the water of the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will take care of us, and we can abide in you, and you will give to us that gift forever. That water that will quench our thirst for the world, but satisfy our thirst for you. Lord, give to us the ability to see that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand. An opportunity, if you would, to say this is the well that Jesus is coming to. And you're walking by and you're seeing this man and you're wondering, what in the world do I do? How do I satisfy my thirst? Jesus has uniquely given to us the ability through prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit to communicate to you your needs and through prayer, open up the door of opportunity for Christ to change your life, to save you, and to satisfy you. It may not be easy. It may be very humbling. But at the same time, it is terrible that we stay in our sin without God. But when we humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need you, the Lord takes it, loves us, forgives us, and satisfies us. That word satisfy is something that we need more than anything else. Are you satisfied where you are spiritually? And if you are not satisfied with where you are, let God quench that thirst. Take care of you every step of the way. These altars are open for you to pray. If you want to pray with somebody, just let me know. Please come and pray and let the thirst of God, the hunger of God, the power of God to take over your life. Let us sing the song.